Take it away, Keila. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and we can jump into today's discussion. One second. All right, here we go. All right. Good morning. And um, welcome to the Linux Foundation Public Health overview of Cardia, including an interoperability um, and interopathon update. Um, to get started, we can just quickly introduce ourselves and the project. So my name is Keila Shatskin. I am a co-chair of the Cardia Working Group. We'll talk about that schedule and how you can participate later in today's meeting. Um, and I have been working in health information exchange and, and health IT in general for uh, many years here in New York and um, part of the health sort of subject matter expertise on the Cardia project. Ken Ebert is the CTO of Indicio, who has been pivotal in supporting Cardia. And Ken, you want to take a second and introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Ken Ebert, the CTO at Indicio. I'm co-chair of the Cardia um, Working Group, and I've been in uh, healthcare for about 10 years prior to uh, moving over into decentralized identity. Uh, enjoy working on the Cardia project and trying to help uh, benefit uh, people around the world with uh, privacy-preserving credentials. Mike? Hi, everyone. My name is Mike Hebert. I'm the enterprise team lead at Indicio, so I program the server-based software. Uh, I've been in web development for about 15 years and in decentralized identity for the last two and a half. And I'll be running a demo of the software today. Excellent. Thanks, Mike and Ken. So just really quickly, a couple of um, logistics things. This is being recorded, so many of you will be enjoying this uh, probably from the comfort of your own time. <laughs> but we do have a panel for Q&A. So if you do have any questions as we go through this, please feel free to let us know. Or you can participate in a Cardia meeting in the future and ask your questions there. It's my little plug for now. <laughs> More to come. So moving on, um, I think we can just jump in and get started. As we mentioned, the Cardia project is a, a project under the Linux Foundation for Public Health. And just jumping into a little bit of sort of what is Cardia and why does it exist? We needed a, a way to create a secure, interoperable, privacy protecting framework to solve for currently and, and sort of as the initiative was COVID. And we'll talk about how that's been expanding over the um, evolution of that of this pandemic that we're all living through, but also to make sure that it is extensible um, and and can be supported through the ecosystem that we will cover in just a second here. So the ecosystem includes. Um, so for many of you, this may be common knowledge at this point, but just in case we're going to walk through this quickly. This is the trust triangle, which you may or may not have seen before. It starts with um, our, our little gentleman on the left here. This is the issuer of a credential. And in this scenario, this could be a lab, this could be a healthcare provider, um, a, a state health agency like a Department of Health, for example. And they are going to issue a credential, which is cryptographically signed by the issuer. And at the point that they're issuing, they're also identifying themselves as an issuer on the, um, on the ledger, which we'll cover in another slide. That credential is being distributed and issued to the holder or the requester. This person can wear many hats. They could be a patient, they could be a person, they can be a traveler. Um, we're gonna call them holder in this content context, excuse me. That holder, once they've received their credential, are then, it's theirs to decide what they do with. So they um, can then share it with a verifier. That verifier can um, confirm the validity of that credential by verifying the issuer through that did or decentralized identifier that was the publisher who, who issued the credential. 
And some interesting and exciting things about that verification process is that because of these credentials, there can be a with, uh, withholding of some of that data. We can do predicate proofs and we can control the information that's accessible by the verifier to only what they need to know to perform that verification for whatever the use case is that they're supporting. Anything to add on that, Ken, before we move on? Yep, the, the, uh, the idea of selective disclosure and predicate proofs are two examples of privacy preserving um, uh, technology that is built into the system. Another one that's worth mentioning is the use of DIDCOM to establish and communicate in a cryptographically secure channel on top of any transport that's available between the issuer and the holder or the holder and the verifier that allows for um, the transactions to not be snooped or um, uh, monitored in any way and allows for the, the parties to know who they're talking to at the other end. So that's another important part of, of the technology. Great. So the Cardia framework has provided a couple of tools to support the, that trust triangle that we just looked at. And those include a health enterprise agent, a government enterprise agent, the verifier mobile agent, a uh, mobile, uh, excuse me, a holder mobile agent. And then of course, this is all supported by the Hyperledger Indie network, um, where, which is the ledger that we're, we're using in this case. So just a quick walkthrough of uh, one of the workflows that we've supported is that the health agent is issuing a credential and they're issuing that credential using defined schemas. And these schemas play a really important role in this whole flow. Those schemas are defined, for example, around how to issue a lab credential. And they've been designed in a way that they're neutral so that they can support any kind of lab content, similar to vaccine content. Any vaccine can be supported in those schemas. And those schemas allow for all of the parties engaged to know what to expect in terms of the structure and content of what's available inside those credentials. So the health agent is going to issue a credential following a schema. The, the, in this workflow, that person who now has their credential in their wallet is going to present it to, in this case, a government enterprise agent. And this agent is wearing two hats. They are both verifying the health status and issuing a derivative credential that says we vetted this person and are labeling them now as a trusted traveler. And so they're issuing uh, that trusted traveler derivative credential, which does not contain the health data. And this is another way in which the privacy is being protected for this person because the government is saying, we did the work, we checked the sensitivity of an information here, and we're saying they're okay. And now the holder can take that derivative credential and go show it to a restaurant, or maybe they wanna go see something on Broadway that says that they're, they're allowed in and can be um, considered safe based on the government's definition of that. Ken, anything you wanna add there? Yeah, because the, the credentials, as you mentioned, are um, published to well-known schemas and they're, they're broad schemas, this can be used for things other than COVID travel. This might be useful for um, an employee who has to have a regular uh, health test in order to uh, care for senior citizens or something like that. So it doesn't have to be all travel related, but the, the schemas are more generic than that and, and are flexible in, in how they're going to be used. It's also interesting to note that um, each of these are agents which represent and act on behalf of the organization or person that they represent. And so an agent is a, a concept that is pretty well known in the decentralized identity community as uh, somebody, the, a piece of software that has fiduciary responsibility to the party that it represents. Great, thank you. Okay, another layer of sort of sauce that makes this all work is machine readable governance. And so part of the Cardia framework includes machine readable governance. This is uh, code that is allowing the definition of roles and, uh, and deciding what is considered in the example that we just walked through sort of safe as a health traveler so that 
that logic can be applied in a systematic and repeatable way by the computer systems and not a human, right? So today humans are looking at a piece of paper and looking at dates or whether or not there is, um, you know, the, the lab is showing that they're healthy or not healthy in whatever context and definition that might be. The machine readable governance allows for that to be handled dynamically and systematically across these agents. Mike, I see you popped in. I do have some more comments on this, but before we go there, go ahead. So the idea here is we're going to encode decisions that a human would normally have to make in a format that's readable by the machine that you can uh, have the software react to. One of the best benefits to the way that we've done it is that it uh, allows for quick changes. There's one central file that all the agents reference. And when you make changes to that central file, then all of the agents can uh, update their understanding without having to redeploy server code or uh, release updates for the mobile agents. Another important distinction is that this is uh, publishable by each of the individual ecosystem. So you may have a worldwide system that is interoperable and has the same schemas and so forth, but the decisions are made locally by the local government or whatever jurisdiction it might be. It might be an employer saying for my employees to, to do something, they need this type of credential. And so it can be uh, both hierarchically nested and or distributed. It's completely uh, flexible in allowing for one or more of these machine readable governance frameworks to be in play and for the appropriate one to be referenced at the time of its use. Excellent. So a couple of things about Cardia at a glance and just to piggyback on the comments around machine readable governance is that it really is enabling that portable so it can be disseminated quickly right and dynamic trust if something changes um, it can be implemented relatively on the fly without code up, you know, upgrades and having to um, change how things are functioning as long as they already leverage machine readable governance. It can also support role definitions, again, to support the sort of evolution of these ecosystems. If somebody's role as an issuer changes, maybe, maybe they're no longer trustworthy as an issuer, that can be adjusted in the machine readable governance and disseminated in a quick and um, widely implementable process. It also, I think one of the most exciting things is that it can support automated decision trees. So you can establish who can have what role and sort of what happens next because something passes or fails a check in the machine readable governance. And so it's a lot of that um, process can be predefined and built into the machine readable governance flow. It also supports offline verification. If you have cached the machine readable governance, you can then be scanning and verifying, for example, without connection to the internet, and that device would be able to apply the machine readable governance offline, which again is a huge um, challenge that we've been able to overcome in, in putting this on the ground in a real world implementation. And then a couple of other points, just really quickly, it's allowing user control as somebody who works in healthcare, right? Putting the onus of privacy on the person themselves about whom their data is represented um, is really big. And in this case, the holder defines who they're willing to share their data with. It's not happening um, behind the scenes or unbeknownst to them. Also supporting uh, the privacy by design and tamper evidence, getting rid of paper. We've seen a lot in the community about people forging their COVID documentation, for example. Um, and so this would prevent that from happening because we're having a trusted issuer digitally issue and verify the authenticity of that credential. And that really is very, very valuable in this ecosystem. So moving on we can talk about our first, uh, one of our first trials. Mike, to you. So CETA has been uh, one of Cardia's most important partners. They uh, were one of the first to arrange for a real world uh, demonstration of the technology and they donated 
uh, the code that they help us develop as the initial starting point for Cardia. So the, uh, we've done two trials in Aruba, and uh, the first trial was in April of 2021, and uh, we went to we worked with the Aruba government and health system and some local uh, venues to arrange for a uh, demonstration of the technology. So travelers would arrive at the airport and they would take their test in the airport and would be, for, for COVID, they'd be issued a credential that says they had been tested and then they would go to their um, hotel to wait for the results of their test. And then when the test results came through, they were issued another credential that had the results of their test. And then that was presented to, so that was with uh, the health lab uh, from the hospital system there. And then those credentials were presented to the government agent, which uh, checked them to make sure that the person was COVID negative and had followed through all the steps they were supposed to do. And if uh, the test was negative, then they were given a trusted traveler. And that trusted traveler would allow them to go to a couple venues which were running a test to say, uh, you're allowed to enter because you are healthy. The government says so. And uh, we were able to demonstrate that the credentials uh, would work from being issued by a medical provider and then being verified by the government and then later the trusted traveler being verified by the venues. Uh, the second trial in December of 2021, we were able to uh, implement machine-readable governance. And so the systems would check the rules for which COVID tests and vaccines were allowed and valid and what, what the time ranges for when those tests or uh, vaccines should have been received were. And uh, based on that, um, were they allowed to come to the island? The other thing that that trial implemented was instead of requiring a test on the island, uh, it, people were allowed to test in the United States and Canada before they, they came to the island. So they got a thumbs up or a thumbs down on whether they were allowed to board the plane before uh, they ever got to the airport or and whether they were allowed to enter Aruba before they arrived in Aruba. And so uh, that was a really crucial trial for making sure that it works in the real world under real conditions. And we have uh, a short little video that's coming up here that will talk a little bit about the trial and then we'll do a demonstration of some of the code. Great, okay, so this is just a, a quick video that was put together that highlights the workflow in Aruba. It's, I think, just like a, two minutes long. So we're gonna go ahead and play this and then we'll get into a live demo from Mike.
Excellent. So I think just to highlight before we pass this to Mike really quickly is that the verifier is only getting access to the fact that they are a trusted traveler. They don't know their health status. That doesn't need to be known by the verifier in this scenario. That's why there's the derivative credential to help with that. Um, and so that is a, a huge part of this implementation as well. So Mike, to a demo, and I can stop sharing and you can take over. So here we have two agents on the screen. On the right is my mobile holder application. And on the left is the uh, lab for issuing health credentials. So there are a couple steps to uh, allowing the lab to identify the patient that they're working with. And since that's mostly just me entering data points about myself, I've done that uh, ahead of the demo. So now we're going to go through the rest of the process. Once the patient is known to the lab, uh, the lab is going to issue the health credentials that this uh, traveler needs to go through this process. So we're going to issue a lab credential here. And so on the, on the left side of your screen is the lab issuer. And then on the right hand side is your holder wallet, correct? Yes. Excellent. So we're getting both views. So just to speak from a healthcare perspective, while Mike is using the manual solution, this issuance of a lab credential or another other healthcare credential can come through stand from standard um, interfaces, right? So this can be replaced instead of using a UI like this, you can leverage health transactions and translate them into verifiable credentials. All right, so I've issued a credential and you'll see that the, or I've offered a credential and you'll see that the offer has arrived here on the mobile phone. We can go ahead and take a look at the fields here. So um, as a patient, I can see, oh great, my result is negative. And so I'm happy to receive a negative result for my COVID test. So I will accept this credential. And you can see that on the right, the credential has been accepted. And on the left, the uh, lab knows that I have received it. And so um, the, there are other workflows for vaccines and exemptions, um, but today we're gonna do just a limited lab result and so now this traveler is ready to go and interact with the government, say the government of Aruba, um, to uh, proceed in the workflow. So we're going to, again, this would be, there's a different workflow that's more automatic, but we're going to do it manually today. Come on. We're going to connect to the government agent. And the very first thing the government agent does is request um, some demographic information. And uh, so this just takes a minute, um, but this is so the government can identify and then later contact a traveler if they need to. I'll just fill that out as fast as I can. It's not particularly exciting, but. So Mike, this could be either um, self-attested data that's filled in like you're doing it now manually, or it could be scanned from a uh, um, from the passport itself or from a government credential that already establishes this uh, demographic type of data. So the this is the standard Cardia workflow, which defaults to manual because the integration process for you know what standards um, for demographic data or know your customer KYC that are in play, uh, those differ so uh, drastically from uh, jurisdiction to jurisdiction that keeping the, the default card implementation simple is wise, but you can do, like Ken said, there are other ways to do this and uh, we can have some pretty 
uh, interesting and uh, customized integrations. This is also a little bit where Cardia drew some boundaries for where it was focusing on, right? There are many different ways to identity proof somebody and to capture this demographic data that was not necessarily core to the Cardia um, focus. And so it was left to sort of plug in your solution for some of these aspects. Okay, so we've submitted that identity information and uh, we're gonna do the manual process today. So the uh, manual workflow would be, now that we're connected, all my information for, about demographics here, the government would issue a trusted traveler. And the first thing that happens in that flow is a request for the lab results uh, credential. So it says, we'd like to see this information from you about your test. And since you want to go to Aruba to enjoy the white beaches, uh, you have an incentive to share that information so you can approve. So uh, my uh, lab was accepted. So I've been offered a trusted traveler. And I accidentally clicked a button there. So we'll accept the trusted traveler. And that's been received. And then the last step would be to go to um, a venue such as uh, you want to go to the sporting stadium or you want to go into a casino, which tends to be a little bit crowded, or you know some other sensitive location that says, we need you to be free of COVID. We want the government's assurance that you're free of COVID before you can enter. So this is a, a simple server-based verifier. Um, we nicknamed this one restaurant.cardia and to, to give people the idea that maybe a restaurant wants to check your health status. So when I come to the door, the person at the door could say, would you please verify your health status before you come in? And so I'd say, sure. Now I'll scan your QR code, connect. And then the verifier is going to request my trusted traveler ID and I'll accept to present that. And now the verifier has verified that my credential is valid and uh, all that they receive is the trusted traveler ID. All that's displayed on the screen is the last four digits. And that way the person running the verification sta station um, can make sure that, uh, that each person who comes through has a unique ID uh, without displaying the whole thing and without revealing any other sensitive information. And so that's the full process from uh, receiving a health credential to being verified by the government to being uh, verified by a venue that I'm safe to, to travel and to enter a venue. That's excellent. Jumping back into our presentation. Thanks, Mike. And now to you, Ken, to cover our interopathons. So part of uh, the success of Cardia is um, establishing a community around the code and the sharing of it and its interoperability. To prove out the interoperability, we haul, held um, our first interopathon, kind of like a hack fest, but it's proving out interoperability um, back in September. Um, because travel restrictions were still in place, we decided to have our, our meeting virtually and have the participants all um, come to a large Zoom gathering and then have breakout Zoom rooms where they could go to do individualized testing. The, the format was that we were uh, trying to initially uh, have them test against a reference code um, and then test against each other to work out any other um, peculiarities in, in interoperability or misunderstanding of how the workflows were supposed to work. We had um, focused our first interopathon on establishing connections and then the basic Cardia workflow of a lab issuing a, some type of healthcare credential. And we had them test both uh, issuing lab credentials, um, vaccination credentials, and an exemption credential, 
um, and then consuming those all by the two. So once the holder had those credentials in hand, they could present one or more of those to um, the government for verification. And then the government would in turn switch roles from being a verifier of the healthcare data to the issuer of um, the trusted traveler. And then we had a, a mobile uh, agent to help with verification of the trusted traveler. So that's kind of the format. And this we uh, allowed four hours of uh, time for our participants to uh, test first against the reference implementation, then against each other. And then we had some rooms that ended up being debug sessions for people who had problems and needed to resolve where they had gone uh, astray in, in the workflow. Um, it was a, we had um, publicized the event uh, fairly heavily so that we people would know that it would exist. Uh, people who had attended our meetings were also informed of the event. And then we had um, the reference code available to test against. That was our first interop event. Lessons learned, make the reference code available in advance. Uh, that way people can pre-test and figure out if they've uh, got it right or not. Um, also, um, since the Cardia um, implementation has multiple agents in play, uh, we offered office hours to have um, the ability for participants to meet with uh, maintainers of the Cardia code so that they could get some uh, assistance and help in um, moving their project forward to be compatible with the, the Cardia um, interop specifications. Um, we also had some areas of friction. Um, some of the interpretations in the, the ARIES um, framework, which is underpins the Cardia code, uh, were ambiguous and allowed for multiple different states of, of connection, either connectionless or connectioned interactions. And Cardia had not supported the connectionless interactions because we felt that the relationship was uh, important to maintain. And that caused some, some participants to fail uh, when they attempted to use a connectionless interaction with uh, the Cardia. They also discovered that uh, shortened URLs were not uniformly uh, supported by all the participants. And so some uh, connection URLs that were shortened uh, failed to allow people to connect. But these are the types of things that uh, became evident uh, during the testing and the, the, uh, to make sure that uh, everyone had the same understanding of how it was supposed to work. And that shared understanding did, was uh, incomplete. So. Um, that's the, the type of things that you hope to discover in these types of events. So we deemed this our first interop uh, a success and then immediately scheduled our second interop event. The idea is to try to establish a regular cadence of the interop events so that people know that they're happening, they have an opportunity to prepare and they can kind of keep their code current and uh, interoperable. Um, the venue we used was similar in our second uh, interop as as we had used in the first one, we found that the Zoom meetings were effective and reached people who otherwise might not have had travel budget to attend, even though it was possible to hold a, a physical meeting uh, for an interop uh, now that travel restrictions had somewhat subsided uh, by March of this year. Um, again, we tested the workflow. We tested all four agents who were involved in here. There's uh, the health uh, agent, the government agent, uh, and the verifier agent, in addition to our mobile holder agents. Um, a new focus was to try to move forward on the out-of-band connections um, in alignment with the ARIES community goal of phase one being completed by the end of March in, in uh, 2022. Um, this was a, a good test. It, it was not specific to Cardia, but Cardia was a good place to uh, test the fact that Cardia had adopted the out-of-band connections and therefore anybody who had a, an agent, even though they weren't uh, fully implementing Cardia, that they could take this first part of the test and see how well they could perform on just the out-of-band connections. Another area that was new was the introduction of machine readable governance. We didn't try to uh, swallow the whole elephant in one bite but we focused on trusted issuers and verifiers. 
So um, identifying a, a participating entity as a trusted issuer or a trusted verifier uh, helped um, get the, the ball rolling on uh, machine readable governance. Lessons learned on, um, out of, on interopathon number two. The out of band um, was somewhat ambiguous on part of its specification on the ACK of an of the connection. Um, but Cardia had implemented it one way and some of the other agents had implemented it a different way. And so we uh, specify in our own interop profile, the fact that we are relying on uh, something that's optional and uh, hoping that the specification in RFC that describes it can be tightened up a little bit. The Q, we had some uh, new functionality that got tested, although it wasn't on the schedule. Uh, it was the Q&A protocol that um, allowed for some participants to do a better um, workflow, but it caused some other participants to fail and uh, require adjustments to their code to be interoperable with some of the agents. Um, again, we learned that even though making the reference code available, making it available sooner would um, be even better um, to allow for more time for participants to pick up new code segments like the machine readable governance and insert it in their code. Um, we also have discovered that when you're hosting an interop type of event and you have multiple things that are going to be tested, uh, it would be important to have the participants indicate which specific tests or sub portions of tests that they were interested in testing so that we could do more um, uh, targeted pairings of people who had compatible things to test and uh, make the process a little bit more efficient. Cardia interop number three. We've already tentatively picked a date that's about three or three months out from the previous test to target our next batch of, of uh, functions. Uh, obviously, we will be testing our, our um, interactions similar to the, the process flow that we have today. Uh, we are looking at um, additional testing on the out of band and moving that forward and being ready for the next step, uh, which um, is a possibility of including did exchange once you've done the out of band invitation. Um, we are also looking at further pushing on uh, machine readable governance to uh, perhaps include the not only the trusted issuer and verifier, but um, looking at some of the uh, actions that can be taken and um, uh, making those part of a, another test sequence to see whether or not the machine readable governance file can be interpreted correctly and used by the agents that represent some of the other participants. Um, we also looked at uh, demographics and think that we could do a, a, a better job of helping make the demographics more uniform because that seems to be a stumbling block uh, on implementations um, when different organizations have different ideas about what the demographics ought to look like. So those are tentative uh, things to be included in the next interopathon. But having that idea of publishing what we're going to test, giving people adequate time to prepare, and then holding a test event that allows them to get together in an either in a private way to test in, a, in their own breakout room without recording if they if they want to do it that way, or allowing um, it to be um, shared and, and uh, have the most benefit for uh, helping others to see where problems might exist and to resolve them. Those are our, our ideas around uh, interopathons, and we've, we feel like that that's been a, both a community booster for uh, Cardia itself and for uh, support for the ARIES community as well to test out uh, fe features that are common to all ARIES agents and not uh, specific to Cardia. Excellent. Okay, so just quickly, we want to touch on where, what sort of, what are those use cases? We, we've hinted that while COVID was one of the use cases that helped drive this project forward and um, sort of help leapfrog through some of these, these hurdles, we are also very aware that this, um, that this framework has a life 
beyond COVID. And so we've been discussing both through our, our working group, but also um, through the other brainstorming sessions, where this applicability lives. So we've covered the travel and tourism use case. And we talked about, for example, using this to get into an entertainment venue or some other um, sort of crowded public space. There are other use cases around um, sports and athlete management. So they, they have sensitive data points around their, um, their performance indicators that could be issued through credentials, through trustworthy sites and shared in um, privacy protecting ways. There's a whole slew of use cases around clinical research, both for consent related to clinical research, but also the, the intimate data exchange that is involved in that. Um, we, we touched briefly on the idea that there are health requirements that may continue to persist. These are not necessarily limited to COVID. So for example, educational health requirements in the US, most colleges require a meningitis vaccine, for example. And so that could be um, supported by the CARDIA framework and the existing schemas that we've designed to support those data flows. Similarly, around employee health requirements, which may even be more stringent, we've talked about that there are vaccine requirements. For example, certain health facilities require flu, annual flu vaccinations. Um, we've talked about lab testing like TB, again, for, for status of employment, and potentially drug testing, all of which are highly sensitive information that would be supported through our existing schemas um, and work we've been doing at Cardia. And then I think there's a lot around general consent and release of information. We do have a medical release schema, which we did not demonstrate for you today, just to sort of trim down what we were showing. But it is part of the conversation that we've been having within the Cardia working group. And I think the, the whole conversation around consent will continue to be an important one for, for us to explore in this ecosystem. Next is where are we going? So we talked a little bit about this sort of making sure that we're aware of those use cases and implementation and applications beyond COVID, um, especially as the world is evolving very rapidly in this space. We need to know uh, that we've kept a pulse on what's important and how this can be applied as a tool in this space. The other is the machine readable governance seems to be the special sauce that's pulling this all together and making it really viable from an implementation perspective because of those defined workflows and decision trees and kind of being able to disseminate that information and who's in the ecosystem, who's not in the ecosystem is really, really applicable both to the health sphere, but also to many other applications where Cardia and other uh, verifiable credentials may be implemented. And we touched a little bit on other key factors and features that we're focused on. So internationalization, being able to support languages beyond English, for example, um, that includes display layers and, and other um, features. For example, machine readable governance may also need to be able to accept um, values that are non-English, which is the base for today's implementation. We talked about out of band and did exchange protocols and that Q&A, which really will drive those more complex um, implementations, like do you want to share your vaccine and your lab test? What about this other lab test? Those Q&As will allow those um, decision trees to be more complex as we move to other implementations. Moving on is how can you participate and where do we go from here? So all of our information and details can be found on our website, which is cardia.app. There is a groups IO email distribution group. That is the best way to stay in the loop. That email um, sends out reminders about meetings coming up and agendas, also around interopathon events. So if you sign up for those emails, you will be in the loop. We also are on the LFPH Slack and, and there's a Twitter. And just quickly to cover sort of ongoing agendas through our working group, we meet every Thursday at 12 Eastern. And we've laid out a little bit of a schedule for the meetings over the course of the month. The first meeting of the first Thursday of the month is to cover basic intro to Cardia. This is a really good starting place. Although you've probably learned a lot through this um, session today, this would be a great place if you wanted to come 
dip your toes in and learn a little bit more um, about how to get started with Cardia. The second and fourth Thursdays tend to be more technical deep dives. And the third Thursday of the month is usually geared toward making sure that we're communicating effectively to, um, to the industry and also getting the word out about Cardia and its use cases in an effective way. And that is our, our general schedule every now and then. There's a fifth Thursday, which we'll have as a wild card, <laughs> although sometimes we've given that back as um, time for all, you all to get your work done. And that gets us through our planned agenda. Ken or Mike, do you have anything else to add? We're excited to have anybody who wants to, to participate in the Cardia uh, ecosystem and, and work to develop the community and push um, both the technology and its application forward. We're grateful for the opportunity to come present today. Thank you very much. I'll just echo that. It's been a pleasure to share. It's been a pleasure to work with the Cardia community and anyone who wants to participate. Uh, we like the broader feedback and suggestions to make it more powerful and useful for everybody. So hopefully we'll see you all later. Excellent. I can go ahead and stop sharing. Um, and I don't think we have any questions that have come in in our Q&A box, but if you do have any questions, feel free to chime in or, um, or you can participate on our next Cardia meeting on Thursdays at 12 Eastern. We look forward to seeing you. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye.